understand that. Okay, can you all understand me okay then? Yeah. Yeah. You sure? Yeah, okay, good. Excellent. <laughs> or was it from the was it danger? <laughs> okay, no. Good. Uh, are there any questions about what we have just been doing? Any lack of clarity or anything that needs to be looked at? Sort it out or really happy? Yeah. Crystal clear? Yes? Okay, yeah. Please, sir. Um, the first time that we were talking about was about meditation. Yeah. So when we were talking about the rapture and the pleasure, as the beacon is great, in the context of meditation? Um, it, it, it is. A, what, what the sutta shows you, it shows you how the mind develops naturally. And so it is, uh, it is essentially about meditation, because these are the things that happen in meditation practice. But some of these things can also happen outside of meditation practice as well, to some extent. But it is really a, a, meditation, a meditation thing, yeah. So um, this is... Um, this is why I call it the, the psychology of meditation. The Buddha, it's interesting the way the Buddha works. He, he shows these things from different angles. Sometimes he shows you meditation from the angle of what you have to do, right? So you watch the breath, and then you watch the short breath, the long breath, you watch the whole body of the breath, you watch the calm down, the, the kaya, uh, kaya sankara, etc. Right? This is from the Anapanasati Sutta. So he shows you what you have to do, how you focus. Uh, but here he shows you the experience that you're having, right? Uh, so what experience are you having? So it's kind of two different angles. Uh, the same idea. So uh, even though some of these things can happen outside of meditation as well, uh, it is really in meditation practice that these things really happen, especially when it comes to things like sukha and samadhi, right? Uh, you, you can't really get into samadhi while you're working or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. So when it's saying about the tranquility in the body, yeah. is it talking about the body in a conventional sense or is it talking about the body sequences in Anapanasati? Breath is the body of the body. Okay, uh, I think it is um, probably here, it is probably the main reference is probably to the physical physical body. Uh, but there are places in the suttas where it divides these factors up into uh, two. For example, there, I think if you go to the Bojanga Sangyuta uh, on, on the factors of awakening, uh, you find that the Buddha talks about how do you divide the seven Bojangas into 14 aspects. And then it says the way, the way you uh, divide the pasad, this is the pasadhi in Sankhojanga, which is the uh, factor of awakening, which is tranquility. And, uh, you can divide it into kaya pasadhi and chitta pasadhi. Uh, so there are, it, is, it can be both, but I think the emphasis here probably is on the, on the physical body. Uh, because, then, because of the chitta, it leads to happiness, right? Which, which then, then is the mind, so the mind also comes out. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, oh, maybe we can take them in the evening. Is that okay? Yeah? Because then we can do the more. Yeah. Great. Um, the question is here. Uh, the sutra straight away talk about the virtues, is it? The behavior is virtues. Yeah. But it doesn't give uh, more definitions about that. Yeah. So different people might have a different uh, way of thinking of uh, behavior as a virtues, but should not. Yeah. So accordingly, uh, what is the meant by the virtues here? Kind. Kindness inside, right? It's actually very, it's actually very simple. You, you, I think you can pretty much summarize the whole Buddhist teaching as kindness, you know. And if you if you just broaden it out enough to take into account physical actions, uh, verbal action, and also your mind, that the whole of Buddhism can really be summarized into that one single word, kindness. So it is. Um, first of all, it's not to do the bad stuff. Secondly, it's to actually do the good stuff, right? Uh, you don't hurt people, but you actually have compassion to people. Uh, uh, and thirdly, I think one of the important aspects in, in Buddhism is the mental, the mental side of virtue. Uh, that it also is about how we think uh, and how we relate to uh, other people as well. Uh. But I will talk more about this later on, especially the mental side of things, because it is very important you know, to get this fully uh, Yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to say anything? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This exactly. This is the this is known as the Ovada Patimokkha. That particular is from the Dhammapada, and very beautiful summary of the Buddha's teachings. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So that's another way of summarizing it. Yeah. To avoid evil, to do good, and to purify the mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. So, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I was just wondering about um, what 
what you mentioned about having um, a really good oral memory in the past and that would affect how um, maybe those teachings were recorded. Yeah. Um, because you know, in more recent times, it's really unusual to have that kind of oral memory. Yeah. Or would yeah. these have been made into chants later on and standardized in, in some way yeah. um, for it to be recorded on? Well, the, the thing is that uh, Indian culture was very uh, was an oral culture had been an oral culture for thousands of years, even before Buddhism came around it. So they had systems for memorizing things. They had ways of doing that. The, the Brahmanical culture, the culture of the Brahmins, they had. Uh, they had memorized the Rig Veda. Rig Veda was the original teaching of the, uh, of the Brahmanic, Brahmanical literature. It had already existed for maybe maybe a thousand years before the Buddha. And, and it has been shown that the Rig Veda has actually been uh, transmitted almost verbatim uh, over, over vast, vast periods of time, almost verbatim, exactly the same. And that is because of the oral techniques that were developed by the Brahmins of those days. And the Buddha would, to some, ex some extent, have inherited those techniques of memorization, right? Uh, the way he structured the suttas and the way that was passed on, that would have been part of that culture that was used at that time. And that was why I think they had that ability to memorize things in such a way. But what is, what is interesting here is that we, not only is that theoretically the case, but I think we can actually show that it actually must have been the case also in reality. Uh, because when I say that the Sarvastivadan school went to the north and the Theravada school went to the south, this was still inside the period of oral transmission, right? This was before they were written down. So this was about 300 BC, type the time of Ashoka. It was only uh, the Theravada, the Pali scriptures that are said to be written down around the first century BC. Uh, that's kind of the traditional date, exactly what happens, a bit more uncertain. Uh, so there was at least a period of a couple of hundred years there, uh, but they were still transmitted orally before they were written down there. And still, even though it was inside the period of oral transmission, when you now compare them, uh, they're still almost exactly the same. Uh, so we can almost know from that that uh, 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 the oral transmission actually was very successful and very reliable and able to transmit them in the right way. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, okay, maybe we should move on then. Um, and uh, because, uh, and there should be quite a bit of time for Q&A also in the last session in the evening, so please write it down if you have any other uh, questions. Yeah. Good, uh, so nice to see some of the familiar faces, by the way, from the last time I was uh, here with KL, so it's very good. Uh, so, uh, great. So let us um, go on to the next one. So now I have just been saying about the importance of virtue, right, on the Buddhist path, and how to establish virtue, why that is so important. And one of my favorite similes that we find in the suttas as well, that talks about how, also about how this works. It's a very a simple little simile, but I, I like just to read it out, uh, because uh, uh, it, I think it's quite meaningful how virtue is to be developed. This is from a sutta called The Fools and Wise, right? Fools and Wise People, from the Majjhima Nikaya. And this is how it goes. Again, when a wise person is on their chair or their bed or resting on the ground, then the good actions that they did in the past, the good bodily, verbal and mental conduct, they cover that person, overspread them and envelop them. Just as the shadow of a great mountain peak in the evening covers, overspreads and envelops the earth, so too, when the wise person is on their chair, on their bed, or resting on the ground, and the good actions they did in the past, the good bodily, verbal, and mental conduct, they cover them, overspread them, and envelop them. Then the wise person thinks, I have not done what is bad, I have not done what is cruel, I have not done what is wicked, I have done what is good, I have done what is wholesome, I have made myself a shelter, I have made myself a shelter from suffering. When I pass away, I shall go to the destination of those who have not done what is bad, who have made themselves a shelter from suffering. It does not sorrow, grieve and lament, it does not Weep, beating, uh, oh, beating the breath, beating his breast, uh, and become distraught. Uh, this is the third kind of pleasure and joy that the wise person feels here and now. 
So this gives you some idea of how how this works, right? This idea with uh, how you get joy uh, from living in the right way. And the idea is, you can, you can see here, is very natural. You don't have to work very hard at it. All you have to do is to make sure that you make a mountain of good karma, right? It's what it's literally saying, you have to make a mountain of good karma. So, and of course, when you, uh, then when you come back home in the evening, after a long day at work, being very busy or whatever, and you try to meditate or something, and all the good things that you have done, they come back to you. Uh, like this mountain, right? It's, it's mountain inside of you, mountain of goodness. Uh, and you just feel, as a consequence of that, you just feel happy. It's a natural happiness. You don't have to force it. You don't have to think about the things you have done. They just come back to you as a matter of course. So this is what we should be doing. This gives you an idea of what this path is all about. It is about creating so much goodness in your life, so much good karma, that when you kind of relax, it comes back to you. You feel, yeah, I have done, done a good thing. Right? You don't even have to think that. It's like it almost happens as a, as a matter of course. And you know in, in your heart that you have been doing what is right. And because of that, you feel a sense of joy feel a sense of fulfillment and you feel a sense of happiness because of that. So this is how it works. So if you don't feel that, it's because your mountain isn't big enough yet. You create a bigger mountain, right? A little molehill, a molehill is not big enough. You have to build it up. Big pile and eventually you have, you have a mountain. When the mountain is big enough, then you cannot avoid the shadow of that mountain. The shadow is just too big and you can just rest. Ah, beautiful shadow then you are so happy as a consequence. And then, of course, because you find that happiness just comes because you have done what is right, it means that when you sit down to, this is exactly what happens when you sit down to meditate, right? When you sit down to meditate, first of all, you take a few deep breaths, right? Oh, let go of all the stress of the day. And as you let go of all the stress of the day, the mountain comes back to you. When the mountain comes back to you, this happens as a natural cause and effect sequence, one thing leading to the next one, and you find all the joy and all the happiness of the path that the Buddha uh, uh, says that we will experience if we practice in the right way. Yeah. So that is there's a little uh, kind of uh, uh, a little diversion there, or not really diversion, but just to give you a sense of how this whole idea of virtue, how it works, and how uh, how it. Uh, matches in with the previous sutta we were talking about. Okay, I'm just looking at that Sangyuta Nikaya down there. It has so many, uh, you have all these uh, little notes in there, that's, that's great. <laughs> Mark, Mark Duffel. Oh, it's, it's just uh, the words of the Buddha, I think. Uh-huh. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah.
I will do as I did before. I will read it out and then I will comment on this as I as I read through it. Because Bikunis, laymen and lay women, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and everyone included. There are gross defilements of gold, the soil, grit, and gravel. Now the soil remover or his apprentice first pours the gold into a trough and washes, rinses, and cleans it. When that has been removed and eliminated, there still remain middle-sized defilement in the gold, fine grit and coarse sand. The soil remover or his apprentice washes, rinses, and cleans it again. When that has been removed and eliminated, there still remain subtle defilements in the gold, fine sand and black dust. So the soil remover or his apprentice washes, rinses, and cleans it again. When that has been removed and eliminated, only grains of gold remain. Let me just uh, stop there because uh, 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 that is uh, uh, already, I think, quite interesting, some of the things that is going on here. Uh, it, it's fairly straightforward, right? It's the gradual removing of dirt and dust and soil, etc., from gold to purify the gold. This is what this is all about. Now, one of the interesting things here, this, this is basically, later on you will see that this simile here is a simile which shows us how we purify the mind, right? So purifying gold is like purifying the mind. This is what this is, this is all about. So the first thing that we will notice here, which is interesting, is that Gold is really here the simile for the mind, right? The mind is like gold. Right? Very, very interesting how the Buddha uses these, uh, uses these words. Of course, in ordinary worldly parlance, gold is one of the most precious things in humanity. It doesn't matter, I think, where you go in the world, everybody likes gold wherever you go. Right? So, gold is one of those most precious things that we can have, right? Uh, very valuable to human beings. Everybody wants to have more gold. Uh, nobody has enough gold in this world then. And in the same way, the mind, the Buddha says, that is really our real gold. Uh, just like the most precious thing in the world is gold, uh, the most precious thing in the spiritual life is the mind itself. Uh, so, why is that? Why, why is it that, how, how, how come the mind is such a, such a powerful thing? Well, sometimes you look into your mind and think, oh, I'm not sure if this is gold, right? This doesn't, doesn't feel like gold sometimes. And, and it's because it is exactly the same problem as with ordinary gold. Uh, ordinary gold, as long as it is defiled, is full of sand and grit and gravel, all kind of problems, uh, it doesn't shine. Uh, it's not beautiful. Uh, it is not really workable. It's not soft. Uh, it doesn't have all the good qualities of gold because of the defilements. Uh, it's exactly the same thing with the mind. The mind also, the reason why the mind isn't beautiful, the reason why it doesn't shine, the reason why it doesn't give you huge amounts of happiness is because of the defilements. That's the reason. So just like gold has to be refined to be able to shine to beautiful, in exactly the same way, the mind, when it is refined, it becomes like gold. Of course, the mind is vastly more, vastly more, is vastly more benefit than gold. Gold, I mean, who cares at the end of the day? Why a bit of gold or whatever? You know, it's kind of irrelevant. But the mind, that is true happiness. Uh, this is the real gold in life, uh, is actually the mind itself. Uh, so a very powerful simile there, this idea that uh, the mind is like gold, the most valuable thing that we can have as human beings, uh, the most valuable thing you can have as any being, anywhere, at any time, is a purified mind. Uh, because it is conducive to real happiness, to real contentment, to everything that you have ever wanted in your life that you can gain through the mind itself. So this is the real goal that we should be searching for now. So yeah, very interesting there that the mind is related to, to gold in this way. This is the first thing, so remember that. Uh, and the reason why you sometimes you may wonder, oh, the gold, I can't see the gold, the gold is not there. <laughs> it is there, it's just obscured, right? Uh, it's behind all the clouds, behind all the defilements, it's always available. If you are able at any particular point to move away from those defilements, the shining mind appears behind there straight away. Yeah? 
Whenever you're able to move away, the shining mind comes back. Yeah? Just like the uh, disk of the moon comes out from behind the clouds, right? One of the famous metaphors in the suttas. Uh, just like the sun rises in the autumn sky after the rain of the monsoon season, in the same way the mind shines forth uh, when it gets purified from defilement. So. so, keep that in mind. Uh, now, the second thing which is uh, interesting about this, uh, and that is the fact that you will notice here that the cleaning and the refining of the mind happens in stages, or the refining of gold rather happens in stages. And you start with the more coarse things, right? Get rid of those. And then you do the medium things, and then you do the refined things. And if you try to remove the refined things first of all, you're not going to succeed, right? You're going to start with the coarser stuff. That's easier to remove than the re refined things. And and in exactly the same way, when we cultivate the mind, you have to cultivate the mind in the right sequence. You have to look inside of yourself, what are the biggest problems, right? You start with that. And once you overcome the biggest problems, you move on to the medium problems. Go from the medium products to the refined ones. Go from the refined ones to the ultra-refined ones, right? The kind of nano nanometer kind of... Um, uh, problems, right? And you kind of go down until everything is rooted out uh, and there are no more problems at all. But it's very important to do it in the right sequence. Uh, get the sequence wrong and it's not going to work. Uh, so you have to, uh, when, you, when you look at yourself, uh, you always have to understand what inside of you really is the main problem. So for example, sometimes you have people going on meditation retreats, like meditating, but they're not even keeping the precepts. Don't even, you know, they don't even bother keeping the five or the eight precepts or whatever, you know? but then they try to refine the mind by going on meditation retreat. Uh, that is getting things the wrong way, right? Uh, you're starting off with the re refined stuff, uh, but not doing the core stuff first of all. Uh, so the sequence here is so important. Start off, does everybody here keep the five precepts in daily life? Uh, yes. yes. Wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> 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 Excellent. That's wonderful, isn't it? It's great when you have a community where everybody practices virtue in such a good way. I, I, did, I didn't listen out for the no's, maybe there were a few no's, I'm not sure, but that, that's okay. But it's inspiring when you have so many good people coming together. Yeah. This is one of the, this is a complete aside, but anyway, it doesn't matter. This is also one of the things I, I really love about our Buddhist community in Perth, the Dhammalok community. There are so many people, I think we have 1,500, 2,000 people or something that I keep the five precepts all the time, right? It's powerful. And it shows you that when you practice things in the right way, when you think about the Dharma in the right way, it actually can have such, such powerful impact. And it compares sometimes, when you look at certain uh, traditional countries, you know, sometimes people are born Buddhist, they don't think about it, so yeah, yeah, just go along, I'm a Buddhist. Do you practice the precepts? Of course not, nobody practices the precepts. <laughs> and, uh, this was the story from, from Thailand. This was, a, uh, you may have heard this before, but this is a story in Ajahn Shah's monastery. And this is a very kind of rude story, but anyway, uh, Ajahn Shah was the Vesak day or some big occasion in the monastery. There was all the people from the village, you know, the towns around coming to the monastery, hundreds of people sitting there. And then Ajahn Shah asked them, how many of you are keeping the five precepts? Right? And he had to look because it was so hard to see anybody lifting the hand. Up. And then finally, you could see two people kind of in the back there somewhere lifting the hand, up, right? And Ajahn Shah was not very impressed by all his disciples. And then he said to them, This is very rude, he said, You are all dog shit. <laughs> right? And then he basically, this, this is what you can do if you are a very powerful teacher. You can save, you can get away with things that other people can't, right? <laughs> if I said that, people would say, what? You bad one, go, go, go. see you again. But when you have very powerful charisma and you have very powerful wisdom, people think, oh, dog shit, don't really. Okay, I'm going to take it seriously. They understand that he's coming from kindness. He's not really being rude. He's actually being kind. And this is the power of a powerful teacher. But this is, this is, sometimes we can't rejoice, right? This was the time of Ajahn Shah, and people weren't practicing that well. Now, uh, our, you know, now Buddhism is kind of spreading around to various people. People sometimes practice much better now than they did even at the time when Ajahn Shah was around. So rejoice in that. See the beauty of that happening, right? It's a wonderful thing that this is happening in the world. This is one of the strengths of coming together in a beautiful community like the BJF or Dhammaloka, wherever it is. You have people who are doing the right thing. 
And it's by far from obvious that this should be the case. So even when you have Ajahn Shah around, it often didn't happen. Anyway, that is a, we're getting completely off track now from what we're supposed to be doing here. But that is one of the funs of doing this sort of thing. And, <laughs> so remember, gradual removal of defilements, right? Five precepts. Get that really well established. Then, then, once you have done that, we try to purify the mind. Then, when the mind gets purified to a certain extent, then we can do meditation practice. Then, when meditation practice happens, then you can get the insights. Everything, stage by stage, in the right way. Then. One of the ways that I think people sometimes get it wrong is, for example, in the relative defilements of the mind. What are the worst defilements of the mind? We, no, we talk about three types of defilements in the mind. We talk about anger, we talk about uh, harming, har being harmful to other people, or we talk about desires, right? These are the three types of things we talk about uh, as defilements. And sometimes we need to understand which one of those is the most important one to focus on. Uh, sometimes people that do all kind of a super practice, right, or 31 parts of the body, uh, or they do all these kind of things. Uh, but remember that the most important one to overcome, and especially I think this is true in lay life, in monastic life, is maybe a little bit different, not very much, but a little bit different. Uh, but the most important one to overcome is anger and ill will. This is the one that creates the most problems in our life, interrelationships, right? Uh, and also it is the defilement that destroys our meditation ship, our meditation the most. Uh, so please focus on that. That is more important than the sensual desires and these kind of things. Yeah. And especially in lay life, because in lay life, remember that it depends on how you live your lay life. Lay life can be lived in many different ways. But if you live in ordinary life and you have a relationship and you have a family and all these kind of things, the sensuality is a natural part of that. Because it's a natural part of that, you have like two things fighting each other, right? On the one hand, you go on retreat and you do a sumo meditation, then you go back and you enjoy your sensuality again, right? And if, if you have that kind of act like that on cross purposes, who, which one is going to win out? But the one that's going to win out is always the desire, always the sensuality, because that is where the mind really wants to go. You're doing kind of the 31 parts of the body, but you're kind of gritting your teeth, right? And you're kind of trying really hard. And as soon as you get back home, you think, okay, now I can relax and can enjoy myself again. It's never going to work, right? So focus on the essential. And the essential is really is overcoming ill will and anger. And it's also much easier to overcome that. It actually isn't that... It's difficult, but it isn't that difficult. It's all about attitude, it's all about perception, it's all about how we look at the world and other people. And if we do that in the right way, it is actually possible to make some very good headway in that area. Now we'll talk more about this later on though. So this is all about getting your priorities right, understanding where to do the work. This is so, so important on this path. Though. If you do that in the right sequence, uh, you will have success and you will be eliminating it then defilements gradually, just like you are doing so uh, with the gold. Okay, so these are the three types of defilements, and then we will see in a second how they relate to the mind itself. But then the sutta goes on. Uh, the goldsmith or his apprentice now pours the gold into a melting pot, uh, and he fans it, melts it, and smelts it. But even when this has been done, the gold is not yet settled, and the dross has not yet been entirely removed. The gold is not yet malleable, wieldy, luminous, but still brittle and not properly fit for work. But as the goldsmith or his apprentice continues to fan, melt and smelt the gold, a time comes when the gold is settled and the dross has been entirely removed so that the gold becomes malleable, wieldy and luminous, pliant and properly fit for work. Then whatever kind of ornament the goldsmith wishes to make from it, whether a bracelet, earrings, a necklace or, or a golden garland, he can achieve his purpose. Right, so here the mind is now almost fully uh, purified, there's only a little bit of problems left in the mind, uh, and uh, these 
kind of problems, the very last things that we have, have to overcome. This is the sort of stuff you overcome, for example, in the Satipatthana Sutta. If you read the Satipatthana Sutta, you see towards the very end it talks about how to overcome the five hindrances, how to understand the five hindrances fully, understand what they look like, how they appear, uh, how they how they arise, how they are abandoned, and how they come to non-arising in the future. Uh, everybody knows about the Satipatthana Sutta? And, yeah, everybody heard about that? Yeah, usually everybody has heard about that Sutta. It's one of those. So, this is the very last thing we need, need to understand, the overcoming of the very last ref, uh, the defilements in the mind. Uh, and then it is interesting how uh, how the goal is described when this happens, right? So you melt it, you smelt it, you fan it, and all these kind of things. And, and these are the kind of actions you do as you approach in samadhi. And uh, uh, whatever, whatever that is, it, it could perhaps be understood as in the next sutta, which is not here, but which is actually found in the Anguttara Nikaya, it talks about three things you have to do to attain samadhi. And it could be that this is a reference to that. Sometimes you apply energy, sometimes samadhi, sometimes upeka, which is like looking on, possibly a reference to that, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, what you do, we're doing those things that slowly and gradually take you towards samadhi, just watching the breath or whatever it is. Uh, and then it says, uh, if you do that, right, you keep on watching the breath, keep on doing the right thing, keep on elim eliminating those last defilements, and it says, uh, there comes a time, that's what it says. Um, yeah, a time comes, right? When the gold is settled and the dross has been entirely removed. A time comes, right? But it's interesting, it doesn't say that, you know, I remove the defilements and then I make the mind pure. It doesn't say that. But what it says, a time comes when this happens. This is an important way of actually understanding that this is not something you can really control. What you are doing, you're just practicing it. You're just watching the breath. You're doing your metta practice, whatever it is. And as you do that, the mind gets purified. And eventually, when that purification reaches a certain point, then the goal is completely refined. It's not something you can control. It's not something you are in charge of. It happens as a matter of course. And what that means is that when you meditate, you should never be looking for the result. A time comes, you don't know when it's going to come. Because you don't know when it's going to come, it's crazy to look for the results, right? Because you can't control that. The mind, as you, know, as you do the practice in the right way, it will just happen. Gradually, gradually, the purification will happen. You don't really know exactly what's going on. And one day, because you're doing the right thing, it will happen as a matter of course. So you just do your job, it's never to look at the results. And you will probably have heard this as well from uh, you know, people like Ajahn Brahm as well. And never look at the results in meditation practice. If you do that, all you're doing is giving rise to desire, giving rise to looking at the future, rather than being content in the present moment. This is exactly what the Buddha is saying here, right? He's saying that, don't worry, it comes a time, you don't know what's, what it's going to be here. Allow it to develop by itself. Your job is just to be with the present moment, not to look into the future. Easy to say that, right? Difficult to do sometimes. But at least, when it comes from the Buddha, it gives you confidence that this is the right way of doing things. It's very hard, especially you get meditation, you get, some, get somewhere, you get a bit excited, right? Oh, it destroys everything. And then you feel... <laughs> so this is what we have to try to avoid in meditation practice. So the time comes, and when the time comes, then all the defilements have been removed, all the dross is gone, and the gold becomes malleable, wieldy, luminous, pliant, and properly fit for work. Right? These are all very important little adjectives that you see there. Malleable, it means that the gold is like soft, right? It is soft, it can be shaped in various ways, that's what it means by malleable. It is something that is very easy to work with, malleable. Wieldy is a simpler kind of word. Often the suttas use a lot of synonyms, the same word again and again. Wieldy and malleable are, simple, are simpler. You can work with the gold, easy to shape into whatever you want. And of course, because the simile here is with the mind, it's exactly the same with the mind. 
Once you come out of samadhi, once the mind is completely purified, the mind itself is malleable. You can do this for the mind, you can do that with the mind, and the mind will do exactly uh, like you say. Just like a, a, a trained dog, you say to the dog, okay, get the newspaper right, the dog gets the newspaper in the morning, brings it back, or, or whatever. I, don't, I never had a dog, so I'm not sure, sure how that goes, how that works, but um, apparently that's, that's what we see in the comics anyway. <laughs> So the mind does what you want it to do, and not only does it do what you want it to do, it is luminous. The Pali word here is uh, Pabasara, and uh, Basa is like emanating light, literally means luminous or shining, the mind is shining, right? Uh, this word Pabasara is sometimes uh, misunderstood in the Pali Sutta, in in, uh, by people who, who, who read the suttas. Uh, and sometimes taken to mean some kind of eternal mind which is always shining here. But actually, it is that mind which emerges once you abandon the defilement, that mind that comes out when you abandon the defilement that emerges. This is the Pabasura mind, shining, right? And talking about before the nimittas and the light in the mind, the, this sort of thing, the shining mind, the beautiful mind that comes out. Just like gold shines, gold is beautiful when it is purified. It is pliant and properly fit for work, right? Same, same idea that we're, we're talking about now. Right? So now you, you get some idea of why it is so important to have samadhi first, right? All of these steps are the removal of the uh, removal of the defilements and the bringing of the mind, bringing the things to samadhi. Now you can see why it's important because it is only then that the mind is workable. It's only then that you can actually use it for the purpose. Before that, it doesn't have a, a capacity, that ability, at least not to the same degree. Now. And I'm sure you can probably relate to what I'm talking about. Sometimes the mind is very uncooperative. You know, you try to read something and it's just all over the place. You can't really focus, right? Sometimes the mind is just really... It is so, it is so variable. It's changing all the time, the mind. And uh, so, and you will notice that when the mind is very pure, it also has the ability to focus, has the ability to remember. Memory also is always enhanced by, um, by the same process. And then you can use it to make anything you like, right? Bracelets, earrings, etc. Whatever you want to do, the goldsmith can achieve his purpose. So that is the simile, and now comes the uh, how this actually works in practice with the mind. So too, because when a bhikkhu, bhikkhuni, uh, lay man or lay woman uh, is devoted to the higher mind, there is, there are in them gross defilements, bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct. An earnest, capable person abandons, dispels, terminates, and obliterates them. This has been done, they remain in them, middling defilements, sensual thoughts, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of harming him. An earnest, capable person abandons, dispels, terminates, and obliterates them. This has been done, they remain in them, subtle defilements, thoughts about the relation, relations, the family in other words, thoughts about the country, thoughts about their reputation, Earnest, capable person abandons, dispels, terminates, and obliterates them. This has been done, there remain only thoughts connected with the Dhamma. Okay, let me, let me stop there, because the last part is a little bit, uh, little bit different again. So let me stop with that. Uh, so here, uh, you can see here that when the bhikkhu or whoever is devoted to the higher mind, the higher mind in Pali is the adhichitta. Chitta is mind, but adhichitta is like the higher mind. And the adhichitta in Pali is just a term for samadhi, a term for the four jhanas and samadhi practice in particular. So here you are devoted to the higher mind, just like a goldsmith is devoted to getting gold, you are devoted to the higher mind, to samadhi and jhanas. So that is the goal in, in Buddhism, is the Samadhi state. So this is the first thing to be clear about him. So he is devoted to this, but there are in him these gross defilements, right? Bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct. Uh, and this 
Basically, I think these three things are roughly equivalent to what in the sutras are called the uh, Dasa Akusala Kamapata, which are the ten pathways of bad conduct found in the sutras. If you want to look it up in the sutras, you can find it in places like Rajmanitaya 41, I think it is. I think it is Rajmanitaya 41, where you have the ten unwholesome ways of, um, of action, uh, of, uh, uh, of conduct. So these are uh, the course defilements. Is that correct? 41? Salaika Sutta? I, I think that's the one. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Salaika Sutta. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so this basically is like the standard ways, right? Bodily misconduct, the idea of killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct, and verbal misconduct. Verbal misconduct is very interesting. And, it's of course about lying, it's about speech, speech which doesn't divide but which brings harmony, and speech which is soft and gentle rather than harsh speech. The last one being idle gossip, right? And instead of idle, not idle gossip, but idle chatter. Uh, instead of that, you speak things that are meaningful, right? And, and you enjoy reading the suit as that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, uh, then uh, you have the defilements of the mind, and these gross defilements of the mind are, I think, the ones that are mentioned in Majjhima 41. So this is like very strong defilements in the mind, right? And it, I think it specifically says there, oh, may these beings be annihilated, right? I don't like them, may I may them be destroyed. And, and sometimes we have these very strong feelings inside of us, right? Sometimes we get this very, sometimes we get very angry about something. Sometimes we think, gee, I shouldn't be thinking this, right? Have you ever had that, ever had that feeling? Oh, this is, I'm not really happy with this. <laughs> and so don't feel, don't feel bad if you sometimes have very strong emotions coming up. It is very human to have that. Uh, I remember there was a, 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 there was a research done at one of the new universities in the United States. I think it was a uh, University of Texas or something like that. Uh, and they asked the undergraduate students. The undergraduate students are always the guinea pigs, right? They're always the one that they use for kind of these studies. That's what what happens. Because they're kind of easy to kind of herd together, okay? Um, so this question or whatever. So they asked these, asked these undergraduate students, uh, did you, in the last year or so, you know, did you have any fa fantasy of killing somebody? Right? How many of you had a fantasy of killing somebody in the last year? And I think the, uh, the, the rate was over 90%. Over 90% of the students had kind of a fantasy of killing somebody, right, in the last year. And, and you know, you, you think, gee, that's, <laughs> that's, that's astonishing. But this just shows you, I don't think that Americans are any worse than anybody else, probably. This is just probably human nature. Sometimes you get so angry, right, and so upset. And things go so, so difficult in your life. Your boss is so difficult, and your whoever it is is so hard to deal with it, that actually you would try to get rid of them altogether. <laughs> and of course, most of the time it just stops with the thought, right? It doesn't go any further than that. But what it shows you that these powerful emotions, these things, they are a, a in each of us the potential is there to do really bad things. And this is one of the reasons why we should always have compassion to other people. Because when we can see that the potential exists in ourselves to do these bad things, we shouldn't judge other people so harshly when they end up doing that. And then we can actually have, even though we, fair enough, if you murder somebody, it's probably good if you go to prison for a while, right? Because you're being dangerous. But still, we should have try to understand that person. And the reason why they did that is because of these incredibly powerful emotions sometimes that arise inside of us. And they arise inside of us because of cause and conditions, not something that we usually can control. So this is, uh, so these things, you know, it's okay. Sometimes we need to acknowledge these things because when you acknowledge them, then you can actually deal with them. And the same thing with uh, the other aspects here of bad mental conduct is like very or very strong cravings, right? And like being wanting, envying the stuff. Other people, oh, I would like to have, you know, their car. I wish I could have their BMW. I would have a really nice BMW. I wish I had that one. Or maybe even, you know, so that's like the beginning of stealing when you wish you had the property of others, right? And you're not actually stealing it, you're getting close, uh, kind of moving in that direction. Uh, covetousness is the usual word in English that, uh, uh, that means just that. Uh, 
And then, of course, the last one is wrong views, right? Wrong views, too, is actually mental misconduct from the Buddhist point of view. So having some idea of the right view is also very important on the Buddhist path. Um, that, if you want to look that up, I'm not going to talk about it more now, but it is found also in that magic Manikaya 41, the Salayaka Sutta for the Brahmins of Sala. Okay, so, uh, and then you have this very interesting phrase, the earnest capable person, right? Uh, to be able to eliminate things, you have to be earnest, uh, you have to be capable, uh, you have to really want to do these things. Uh, you have to understand that it can be done, uh, and you have to apply yourself accordingly. Uh, these things are not going to happen just by kind of uh, reading the suttas, you actually have to apply yourself afterwards. Uh, and to be able to apply yourself consistently to overcome your defilements, you have to have a sense of confidence about the Buddhist teachings, right? You have to have a feeling that it actually works. And then you are able to apply yourself. Then you are able to persevere. And these sort of things can take a long time. When you first come to Buddhism, you kind of read about this, uh, and you think, yeah, okay, it all sounds very good. But it can take sometimes years before you really apply yourself wholeheartedly to this sort of practice, uh, actually really trying to overcome your defilements. Uh, you have, this is the most difficult part of Buddhism, is actually this ability to persevere and to keep going, keep the energy going, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, lifetime after lifetime. <laughs> right? You have to really keep on going. Yeah. Forget about life now, but they only, this life now is the one you have, right? Now we can do something. Forget about that, I was just messing around. Um, but this is the hardest part, uh, because it takes understanding of the teachings and a quite a deep sense uh, to be able to commit yourself to that extent uh, that you actually do this. Uh, so this is the most difficult thing. And sometimes even in monastic life, you know, you see monks and maybe nuns, they kind of hang in there, you know, not really, not really kind of, you know, giving it everything they got. Uh, that is the only way you're going to succeed at the end of the day. Yeah. So you have to be earnest, you really have to commit yourself, you really have to persevere, and you have to be capable as well, right? Uh, uh, and um, this will often mean that you have put in place all the groundwork, all the, all the basic things, uh, so that you are capable. Do you, have to have, do you have to be intelligent? I don't think you have to be particularly intelligent. Uh, so you, you can just be, anybody can practice this path, whether you're intelligent or stupid or whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So if you are stupid, that's okay. <laughs> so it's good, isn't it? It's not actually have to be, this kind of, it's always unfortunate if you have to have some kind of special qualities to do this. Uh, what is more important is your heart, when you are really into it, that's what really matters. Uh, so, um, uh, but you have to have certain capabilities, which means putting in place the groundwork, probably. Uh, and then, once you have that, then you are able to abandon, dispel, terminate, and obliterate these, these particular bad states, right? And this is a very interesting series of words, right? Terminate and obliterate. This is very strong language. And I will show you in the next sutta, it will become very clear what this actually means. Because when you read that, it sounds like you should use your willpower and you should force. 11.45, oh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I, I was, uh, I thought we were supposed to go longer. I, okay, thank you. <laughs> very good. Um, gee, time goes so fast. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, but the, I'll, I'll just finish, finish what I'm saying, and then we can, we can like, go for Dana afterwards. Uh, so, the point here to understand that when you read this, you think, ah, this means I must use lots of willpower, right? So I can obliterate these bad thoughts, I can obliterate these bad habits. But actually, it doesn't mean that at all. But to be able to understand this kind of vocabulary, you have to understand the suttas more broadly. And when you read the suttas more broadly, actually, what this refers to, it doesn't refer to willpower, it refers to wisdom power instead. And once you understand why it refers to wisdom power, it actually becomes very clear how this works. If you use willpower to diminish, to destroy, to obliterate the bad states of mind, all you're really doing is suppressing it. 
as soon as you let go of the willpower, oh, it comes back up again, right? You're kind of holding it down, forcing it down. As soon as you let go of the grip, it comes back up again. And this is the problem with willpower. It is very painful, right? It takes a lot of effort. You feel very tired afterwards. And it doesn't really work anyway, because it all comes back up. But wisdom power, wisdom power is different. Because if you understand that you shouldn't be doing something by wisdom, if you understand that the state of anger is wrong and you understand how to overcome it by wisdom, then it is really obliterated. It is really destroyed 100% as a consequence. And this is how you obliterate. This is how you terminate these things. Not by willpower power, but by wisdom power. And I will show you later on during this uh, during these uh, three days uh, how that works by using wisdom power, and it's very beautiful uh, because when you do that, the path becomes very easy and very uh, very light as a consequence, and very happy. But of course, it takes training and it takes thinking in the right way to be able to do that. Uh. Okay. Now we're going to have to stop for Dana. Thank you very much for that note for reminding me because I was I thought we were going to sit here much longer, but that was obviously a mistake. So have a nice meal, enjoy yourself with the meal, and then we'll see you back here at two o'clock.